Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for human sexuality. In this lecture, we will be talking about men's long-term mating strategies. So we're going to look at a few different things, things like benefits of long-term relationships to men, issues relevant to preferences. So we're going to look at reproductive value. We talked about that with women, but now we're going to look at it with men because it's a bit different when we talk about preferences. One of the main things we're going to look at is reproductive value. We'll look at reproductive value versus fertility, beauty in the eyes of the adapter or adapta adaptations in the eyes of the beholder. We'll look at waist to hip ratio. We'll look at foot size, bilateral symmetry, current ovulatory state. There's some fun stuff there. Um, we'll look at some issues relevant to preferences. Paternity is, uh, certainty is a big one. Um, we'll look at similarities, differences, and trade-offs in the real world. Um, some conditional mate preferences, and finally, evolved mating psychology in modern societies. So we have to ask ourselves an important question. We talked about women's long-term mating strategies, and we talked about how in many species, and in, in pretty much all species, the, the female has the larger initial investment, the male the smaller. And in most species, that after that initial investment, the, the reproduction, um, the, the, the reproductive act, the males are no longer involved. They, they take off, they're, they're gone, they don't do any rearing at all of the offspring. In some species, the males help. In humans, the males help much more. So when we look at that, we talked about some of the evolutionary advantages or evolutionary pressures for men to be more interested in short-term mating than long-term mating. So we have to ask ourselves, why would men evolve a desire for committed long-term relationships or marriage as we're going to look at it when there's definite pressures for them to prefer short-term? Relating to that, um, long term, mostly exclusive. There's no such thing as exclusive relationships in the animal kingdom, by the way. All species of animals that are supposed to be mate for life type of thing, infidelity occurs. Um, it's documented, it's noted in all species that have uh, these exclusive lifetime partners. The infidelity occurs in all cases. Not in all individual cases, but in all of these species. So in long-term exclusive relationships, it's only found in about 5% of mammalian species, and they're actually especially rare in primates. So marriage isn't the inevitability of evolution. And as we had said before, the, the male has, there's costs to, to marriage. Um, less opportunities to, prefer, to pursue short-term relationships and then they're required to provide resources for the spouse. So these are, are drawbacks to long-term relationships for men. So what are the benefits? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. What does a male gain for long-term relationships? We're not asking this in the, the philosophical sense. We're, we're not asking this to, to bash on marriage or anything like that. We're asking it from, from an evolutionary perspective. If there are benefits to not being in a long-term relationship, if there are drawbacks to being in a long-term relationship, for the behavior to have evolved, there has to be some benefit. So we, we look at this. Why would a men evolve a desire for long-term relationships? Well, to attract a, a female of the species. So for humans to attract, attract a woman. And this comes down to it's women's preference to find a long-term partner. So for men to find a partner, period, they, they have to go with a long-term partner because that's what the women are looking for. To attract more desirable women. So um, even if not all women are looking for long-term partners. Typically, the only ones looking for short-term partners 
other than the ones that are looking for short-term partners that already have a long-term partner that are doing cuckoldry. We'll get to that later. But the women who are only who aren't looking for long-term partners, they tend to be less desirable. And we'll come back to that later when we're talking about um, mate value. To increase the odds of paternity. So if you have species where um, many males are are performing reproductive acts while a female is is fertile, then there's paternity uncertainty there because there's chances that that it that wasn't the offspring of the male. If there is long-term committed relationships, it is much more likely that the reproductive act that the children that are come from from the reproductive acts came from the male in the long-term relationship. That's not the, always the case, but it's a higher likelihood. Here's a big one, to increase survival of children. So humans have this long-term uh, development phase. If they've got two parents caring for them, their survival increases. Well, again, evolutionarily, we, one thing I, I had said was evolution is concerned with survival and reproduction, but actually evolution is also concerned with and just as concerned with uh, in survival and reproduction of offspring. If you have kids, if those kids don't go on to reproduce, then it doesn't matter. You, you, your genes only went one more generation. So we've got selective pressures to, to basically do things that would increase our children's chances of surviving and reproducing. And along those same lines, increase reproductive success of children by having a father who is dedicating resources to, to the family unit, then those children grow up with more resources themselves, then they are more likely to, to form relationships. Increase alliances through wife's kin. So we, we are a social species. So things that we can do like have alliances, form alliances through these long-term relationships actually aid us in, in these social outcomes, which can have a net benefit. And the final one is increased social status. And this goes back to all the different things. So let's look at some problems. So some problems when it comes to these long-term mate selection, when males are selecting a, a possible long-term mate, one of the problems is selecting a mate who has the capacity to bear children. Um, we're not looking at female preferences now, now we're looking at male preferences. So in males, one of the ad adaptive problems that arises is selecting a partner who has the capacity to bear children, especially if a male is limiting themselves in reproductive opportunities by getting into a, a long-term relationship. They, there, there is less potentially less opportunities for them to have short-term mating. Then they should be seeking out a partner who has a high chance of reproducing themselves. And what ends up happening here is the solution is a preference for qualities that are correlated with reproductive value. In just a minute, we'll talk about what reproductive value is, but reproductive value is essentially going to be the, the capacity to bear children. And what is um, qualities that are correlated with this? Youth. As people grow older, their capacity to bear children goes down. Youth to a certain extent, obviously, uh, has to have reached reproductive age and not just reach reproductive age, and we'll talk about that in a in a second when we talk about some things there, but not just reach reproductive age, but all reached a point where chances of getting pregnant and having successfully having children have risen. So even someone who has reached a girl who has reached puberty, but hasn't fully developed yet, they might be able to get pregnant, but their chances of successfully having children are lower. So the preference should be a bit older than that to the point where now their, their chances of successfully having children are higher. And health. So health is a, another big one because people that are unhealthy are less likely to get pregnant and have children, successfully have children. So 
what age should men find the most attractive? And um, basically, there is some differences here, uh, but what we're, we're looking at is the, the giving birth. And what age should men find women the most attractive? It should be the age where they have the capacity to give birth and a successful birth. Um, we do have changes over time in when women are actually giving birth. It's moving later, but the, the point is, is like you look down here at the end at 15, very few women are successfully giving birth at that age, even the ones that, that are potentially getting pregnant. So that age shouldn't be attractive. Even 16, it's low. And then it's starting to go up. So right here around this 17 to 18, at least historically, it started to really spike up. Now, modern times, it's, it's even into the 20s where it's really starting to spike up. But the point is, is that there is a, a age that is too young. But at the same time, there's ages that are too old as well as what men should find the most attractive. We'll do a caveat to that a little bit later, but when it comes to, to age, you're looking at about inside that right there. So right from about 17 to 33 is what men should find the most attractive. Doesn't necessarily mean doesn't find those older attractive, just the most attractive. But this brings us to that thing I was saying earlier about reproductive value and fertility. Reproductive value is um, when, when we're looking at it, reproductive value is going to be the, the number of offspring an individual at a given age and sex is likely to have in the future. So reproductive value is number of offspring potentially can have. Fertility, on the other hand, is actual reproductive performance. So when we look at this, which should men have evolved to pay attention to when looking for a long-term mate? The number of offspring that they can have or actual reproductive per performance, number of viable offspring produced? And the, the answer is, that it should be a little bit more reproductive value because even though I keep saying this, this term that, that um, the ability to actually bear children successfully is important. Um, when it comes down to it though, what, what is important here? It's that, that the number of future offspring, but you have to balance it with ability to produce. So which one should they have evolved to pay attention to? A little bit of both, a mixture of both. Um, Yanomamo men actually prefer women that are moko um, or moko dude or perfectly ripe. Those that have reached an age where they can have the, the, the basically they, they can successfully have children. When we look at this chart on the left, why, if reproductive value is the number you can have, why is it actually lower at this point than it is when they get older, when you're talking about the number? Because when they're younger, they could still die of a disease. They could still, if they start having children, die young in childbirth, things like that. So it doesn't actually peak here until you're looking at about 18 to 19 where reproductive value actually peaks. So I already said the stuff on this slide, so I'm gonna be really brief on it. Reproductive value is the number of offspring an individual of a given age and sex is likely to have in the future. Potential expected reproductive potential. Whereas fertility is the actual reproductive performance or number of viable offspring produced. So if age is a very important component of what men look for in women, uh, how is that 
how can they tell that? How can they figure that out? What is it that allows them to determine that? Because as it stands, age is not written on someone's forehead. Uh, so men must have some mechanism for determining how old the, the, the woman is because if that that's important for reproductive value that's important for what a man is looking for in a woman um and then you get even to what's going on with this slide um this is one of those slides i love for this type of thing and that is that if we did put ages on the head sometimes that doesn't even matter got jennifer anderson when she was 51 uh, Allison Hannigan when she was 45, Angelina Jolie when she was 44, Jennifer Lopez when she was 50. Um, all of these women look younger than they are, but we'll come back to that later because that's a completely different animal we're talking about when we're talking about, um, especially when you look at, at celebrities who have a lot of makeup and things like that on, how looking younger is something that that women do intentionally to then look more attractive because if that's what men are looking for is those younger women and all of these are older than that now and they're because of covid there isn't really many good pictures in the last two years of a lot of celebrities so that's why i've got a little bit older because all of these are older now the the closest one you're going to get is Jennifer Aniston is, is only 52 now. It's only been a year since then that picture was taken. So we should look at what is going on, what it is that men look for in women. And what women, what men should look for is things that are cues or indications of fertility in reproductive value so they should be looking for things that are cues of this um, we know that that age is important genes are report important um, health is important but that can't be directly observed by men instead men have evolved adaptation humans and men have adaptations that have been evolved to find attractive anything that correlates with reproductive value. Things like full lips, a small jaw, clear skin, lustrous hair, symmetry. We talked about bilateral symmetry with men. We'll come back and talk about it now with women. That's a one. Hourglass shape. We'll talk about waist to hip ratio in a little bit. Small feet, firm breasts, muscle tone, feminine gait, springy gait. All of these types of things are things that men look for in women because these are things that are correlated with reproductive value. We'll talk about many of these. Most of these correlate with age. But what if what do we now have these as? These are what are what we have as standards of attractiveness. These are the types of things that men find attractive because specifically they're correlated with reproductive value. Some of these are direct cues and some of them are indirect cues of reproductive value. So we get to this standards of physical beauty, things like hair quality, and that's important, skin quality, facial femininity. Um, and why is that important? Because that's correlated with high levels of estrogen, higher levels of estrogen, higher levels of estrogen lead to more likelihood to get pregnant and more likelihood to to then carry that that offspring to term we'll talk a little bit later about how actually we'll talk about a, a woman's cycle and how when a woman is more fertile when she's at the time of the month when she is most fertile when she's ovulating facial femininity goes up facial symmetry well for the same reason we talked about with men Facial symmetry is important because it's an indicator of um, not having had diseases and things like that. Because the more diseases you have, the the more or the less facial symmetry you'll have. And actually, interesting enough, facial averageness is important. 
So this is, doesn't mean the person's average. This is average across um, the the people in the society of facial appearance. So they men have a preference for faces that resemble a prototype. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at that on the next slide. So what is done is that uh, in studies, they'll take pictures and they'll take hundreds, sometimes even thousands of pictures and they will merge all of those together. They will basically take the average of them. So the char facial characteristics that are the most prominent are the ones that come to light and the ones that are, are not prominent fade because they're only in a few instances. And these are all of these pictures you see here on this slide are composites. They are composites of, of many, many, many pictures. And interestingly enough, you've got composites when we look at it, when we go across skin tones. And when you, you look at that, you get some very big similarities here um, across all of these different um, skin tones and, and racial or ethnic origins. So these standards of beauty are consistent across cultures. What is considered attractive in one culture is fairly highly accurate to what is considered attractive in another culture. And actually, even as young as two month olds have been shown pictures and they have a preference for what is defined as attractive by adults. It's very interesting stuff. So we talked about in the last set of slides, a man's physical attractiveness, those, those things that are, are some indicators of, of indirect genetic benefits. A, a man who is more physically attractive tends to be more fit. One who's more fit then can gather better resources, obtain better resources, give protection, pass on those genes for being attractive to offspring. These are all these indirect benefits. Whereas with a female, physical attractiveness indicates her ability to provide both indirect, some of those like pass on genes, stuff like that, but also direct res resources because there's these correlates of being able to have offspring and successfully have offspring, become pregnant and successfully carry offspring to term that are correlated with attractiveness. So that means they can give direct benefits. Attractiveness is a direct benefit because it means that they are likely to then be able to get pregnant. As far as when it comes to attractiveness though, it does vary different. What is attractive? What exactly specifically is attractive? Um, do men value attractiveness more? Do women value attractiveness more? Um, across time and cultures, it, it shifts slightly, but it is always, this is a human universal, always prioritized more by men. Attractiveness is more important to men than it is to women. Attractiveness in a partner. I've talked about symmetry a little bit, but let's kind of look at that. Um, so the question is, do humans, uh, do humans use body or facial symmetry as a cue to good genes? And there is evidence that more symmetrical people generally have more favorable environments during their development and enjoy better health as adults. This is what I've said a few times that if you, if you get sick as a kid, if you have issues if you have lots of like fights or various different things like that if you have lack of nutrition all of these lead to small minuscule blemishes minuscule things some of them are big but most of them are small but these small things over time add up to result in less facial symmetry so when you look at these pictures, the ones on the left are normal, the ones in the middle are high symmetry, and the ones on the right are perfect symmetry. 
If you have to look at these and say which of the three is most attractive, you are likely to say the one on the right of the three is most attractive. I'm not saying you find the person attractive or not, but of the three pictures, what is most attractive? And it's because they've got perfect symmetry there. So our people with, people with more symmetrical faces, they tend to be judged to be more attractive. That is something that is that is a human universal again. It's found in all societies. Interestingly enough, when only shown half the face, people still prefer the faces that are more symmetrical if the entire face is there. It's and that's because even if they can only see half the face, they can detect those minor blemishes and things like that. Let's transition now into body shape. So which of these body shapes would be considered to be, which of these models is most attractive? A, B, C, or D? I can tell you right now that the vast majority of people are going to say C. And that is because she has that hourglass shape of a figure where it comes in and goes back out. There's somewhat in D. So D is going to be also considered attractive, but there is more of an hourglass figure in C. And actually, when you look at her C's waist size to her hip size, you're gonna, if you did a ratio of that, you would find that the waist size is 0.7 of her hip size. The ratio of her waist size to her hip size is 0.7. That is a, the, the magic number in humans of ideal waist to hip ratio. Even with change over years, so in Miss America contestants, they looked at waist to hip ratio in 1940 and 1987. Things were, were there was definitely a, a big change in the, the women who are competing in this. Women now are taller and skinnier. Um, at, over time, women just kept getting taller and skinnier, the ones that were competing. However, despite those big changes, there is very little difference in waist to hip ratio. Even when you take it out farther to 1998, and you could even take it out farther to modern times, the waist to hip ratio is staying between 0.66 and 0.70. It's staying between those two over time. Let's look even more historically. Let's look at statues. Even statues that are have odd shapes. Even statues that have odd shapes. When you look at them, the let's look at Egyptian first. If they take the the average of Egyptian statues, the waist to hip ratio on Egyptian statues, in females, it is right at 0.7. It's actually right around 0.69. Males, it's higher. In Greek statues right at 0 0.7, 0 0.69, right in that range for females. Even in African statues where they're te they tend to be more odd shape, where it wasn't as realistic, there was these odd shapes, so there isn't as big of a spike, even there, the peak is right around 0 0.65, 0 0.68. So even when you've got odd shapes, you get this waist to hip ratio that's about the same. So this is going back thousands of years. Statues going back thousands of years are have this 0.7 waist to hip ratio. It's and it's similar in all the cultures studied. But now we've got this preference obviously for for lower waist to hip ratio. Why is this preference there? Why do men have this preference? Well, that's because women with lower waist to hip ratio, um, to a certain extent, women with the, the lower, ideally right around 0.7, women with the, the waist to hip ratio that's lower, and again, ideally right around 0.7, reach puberty earlier, have fewer problems getting pregnant, 
and show hormonal profiles that are more conductive to becoming pregnant. So women who have a waist to hip ratio of 0.7 get pregnant easier, start being able to get pregnant younger, and to a, a certain extent are able to carry offspring to term easier. And those wider hips go back to that what we were talking about last week, which is how uh, the, the, the size of hips is important for women to be able to have offspring of a, a certain size. And another thing, if you look at this graph up here, waist to hip ratio um, it starts higher in, in childhood, it goes down in adolescence, it gets to the bottom at, in the young 20s, and then it actually starts to climb slightly from there. So the ideal waist to hip ratio time period is the late teens, early 20s. So we've talked about this this um, bit about um, waist to hip ratio. But now let's actually talk about something else. Let's talk about ovulatory state because ovulatory state is important. Why is it important for long-term relationships? Obviously for short-term relationships, if, if the goal is to get pregnant, even subconsciously, the goal is to get pregnant, then it would be important to know because if you're only having one or two mating opportunities, you want to make sure you do those mating opportunities when the when the female is ovulating when she is most fertile. Ovulation is when a female is most fertile. Why is it important for long-term relationships though? Well, long-term relationships, there's there's still this drive to to reproduce, but another big thing for men knowing ovulatory state, it's important for mate guarding, mate retention tactics. It is more important to uh, mate guard when a, a male, it's more important for a male to mate guard when their female is fertile because then it's, it more assures paternity. So men in long-term relationships should care about a woman's ovulatory state because men first should copulate more when, when their mate is more likely to become pregnant and second, men should guard their mate more when she's more likely to become pregnant to prevent her from becoming pregnant with someone else. Again, we're not talking about the ethics of infidelity here. We're not talking about the ethics of cuckoldry. We're, we're, we're just talking about the fact that infidelity does occur. It does occur in humans. It's actually quite prevalent. But the, the point is, is that if infidelity does occur, then men should do things to, to guard against their partner being unfaithful when they are more likely to become pregnant. There's also mate guarding that women do too. We'll talk about that later and, and they should mate guard as well. But right now we're just talking about men's preferences. Are men sensitive to ovulatory state? Ovulation. Um, well, let's look at a, a, a few different things here because it's actually important for if it's not, it is important. If it's important for men to uh, copulate more when the, the woman is in, uh, is fertile and to make guard more, then the, the men should have evolved mechanisms to detect ovulation. Humans are one of the few species that, that have concealed ovulation. We have concealed ovulation. Women have evolved concealed ovulation because of a few reasons. But one of those reasons is so that if they are seeking out better genes for short-term partners, which is something we'll talk about next week, then they, they can conceal it from their partner better. And the other one is um, concealed ovulation is in order to gain resources because if the male isn't doesn't know when that the female's ovulating, then he's more likely to donate and dedicate resources throughout the cycle rather than just at the period of time of ovulation. But let's look at some of the things that do occur during ovulation. When 
women are, are ovulating, their sexual desire increases. Um, actually, when women are ovulating, they, they walk different. They show more of a feminine gait. They tend to dress different. And I'm not saying, not getting into all of that, just pointing out that women who, when they're ovulating, tend to dress in more what would be considered classically as seductive clothing. Um, so when it comes to that, there are things, changes in females' behavior when they're ovulating. Because there's changes in females' behavior, men should then be able to, to evolve ways to detect this. Um, another one, really interesting paper by, by Craig Roberts from Scotland and Jan Havlicek from Prague. Um, they, they did a study on how facial, female facial, attra facial attractiveness actually increases while they are ovulating. So I said this before, um, that, that women's facial femininity and attractiveness, that it actually increases when they're ovulating. So it's, it's one of those that, another thing that's detectable. And why does this occur? Or how does this occur? That is women's facial features become more symmetrical and their complexion lightens when they're ovulating. But are men sensitive to current ovulatory state? I said they should have evolved mechanisms to detect it. And one of the ways they detect it is looking for those things like attractiveness, gait, all of those. But th there's actually more to it than that. Um, T-shirt studies are, are a very fantastic set of studies out there. T-shirt studies are studies where um, men or women will wear a T-shirt for a few days when they're not using deodorant. And if they're showering, they're showering with unscented sham shampoo and soaps. Uh, so that this t-shirt picks up their natural odors. Um, they then put these, after a, a period of time, they put these t-shirts into bags, seal them up, and then later in studies, men or women will then smell these bags. They'll, they'll open up these bags and smell them. And they will rate how pleasant the odor is, pleasant or unpleasant, or neutral, that type of thing. So in one study, um, women were asked to wear the t-shirts for three nights when they were likely to be ovulating and wear a different t-shirt for three nights when they wouldn't be ovulating. Actually, they, they did this in, in multiple different phases when they were ovulating, shortly after ovulation, um, when they were menstruating, shortly after menstruation, that type of thing. Then men who didn't know the women were presented with the t-shirts and asked to rate their intensity, pleasantness, and sexiness. Remember, they're rating these based on nothing but the odor from the shirts. They don't see the women, they just have the odor. And shirts that were worn during, during the, the follicular phase or the when they were ovulating were rated as more pleasant and sexy. Um, they, they replicated these findings and they've, they've been shown in multiple different cultures now that women when they're ovulating are found to be more attractive. However, here's the big caveat. Here's the big exception. That is that for women who are using birth control, this effect is not present. For women who are using birth control, there is no difference throughout the cycle found. So women who are using birth control, hormonal birth control, these changes in the body aren't happening during ovulation. So it, it's not detectable by men. Uh, it even goes beyond this. There's some really interesting things. So um, Miller in 2007 asked um, lap dancers, yes, he, he got funding and got paid to go to the strip club to study strippers at a strip club. He went there, asked lap dancers, dancers to keep journals of their earnings during their cycle. And um, what he found is, is that the, the strippers earned far more when they were fertile, when they were ovulating. So they, they earned far more, even in some cases, twice as much more when they were ovulating as when they were menstruating. Suggesting again that fertility is detectable by men. 
There's other things that could be going on here, such as that women who are ovulating could be, again, doing things that elicit more tips. Like I said, it, women who are ovulating tend to, to um, have more facial attractiveness, but they also tend to dress in different ways, walk in different ways, things like that. So men are likely detecting all of these different things. And what it comes down to is men tip more when women are ovulating. Just like with the shirt studies though, women who were on birth control showed no significant change throughout their face. So they did not have this spike when they were ovulating, when they were fertile. Again, interesting stuff. The other end of detecting um, ovulation is for assurance of paternity. So men seem to have some information about a woman's likelihood of ovulating. Um, it's not complete though, because again, women have, have evolved concealed ovulation. Men are, are, are co-evolving detecting ovulation. It's again, the red queen race where both are, are evolving and co-evolving. Um, but the, the, the information that's there is important to men. And even in primate species where ovulation is truly advertised, females will often mate with several different males during the period when they're likely to become pregnant. Um, so males will, even when it's present, but definitely when it's not present, will, will try to monitor a mate to see if she copulates with another male because it's, it's important to, to basically guard against infidelity. But in humans where the males help raise the offspring, it's even more important because cuckoldry is something that is very costly to men. Cuckoldry is where a male raises another male's offspring, usually not knowing. It's very costly because they're putting all their investment and resources into a male that is not genetically their own. We have ways around this in society because we do adoptions, things like that. We can circumvent this, the, this feelings of, of cuckoldry, but at the same time, it is very important evolutionarily. So we have strong, basically motivations to prevent it. We do have though a sexual division of labor, labor, um, it, especially when these behaviors evolved, men can't be vigilant constantly to to make sure that the 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 woman is not having sex with a different male um the males have to um gather resources they have to hunt they have to do things like that so it does come down to how can a man assure his paternity what are things he can do one thing he can do besides these these methods of mate guarding like i said before is do things like what does the child look like so in the delivery room and in the first few months of life what is the one of the the most interesting findings that i find about this about newborn babies is that more remarks are made that the child looks like the father than the mother this is might be like okay well what's the big deal there well first off You've got more rem remarks that are that are saying the child looks like the father. That is, the the people are trying to get the the father to think, okay, well that that child is mine because he looks like me. But if that's the case, then who should be the ones saying this? Should it be the father's family or the mother's family that's more likely to be the ones saying that? If you guess that it should be the mother's family, you are correct more remarks are made by the mother family of the mother than the family of the father that is because the mother the family of the mother needs to to without even realizing it they're trying to assure the male that the the father that the child is his so that he doesn't leave the relationship the family of the father they've actually got a genetic interest in the the offspring actually being the biological offspring of the male so they shouldn't make remarks unless they're slightly accurate. Another thing that males do is marriage. 
So marriage, what is marriage? It is the, the long-term commitment. Since we have long-term commitments, and this is one of the, the things I said earlier, well, there, there's advantages and disadvantages of long-term relationships. There's more advantages for, for women, but for men, there's advantages too. And that is those in long-term relationships are more likely, well, males in long-term relationships are less likely to be victims of cuckoldry. They're less likely for their partners to, to find short-term partners and be unfaithful, things like that. Well, if marriage is important, what about post-marital sexual fidelity? And one thing that's that's been found, and it should be pretty self-explanatory, men in all cultures view sexual faithfulness as vital and more important than actually any other characteristic. Sexual faithfulness is is for for monogamous couples. So we're not going to get into polygamous. We'll talk about polygamous polygamy and all that later in the semester. But for monogamous couples, which are the norm. Faithfulness is viewed as the most important characteristic. And the best predictor of extramarital sex is premarital sexual permissiveness. So the best predictor of people being unfaithful is actually permissiveness before the marriage. Sexual permissiveness before the marriage. Um, it, so that is why um, men seek out women who are, are more pure or more virgin. And it's, it's, there's, this is the reasoning behind it, whether it's moral or not, we're not getting into whether it's what they should be doing or not. We're not getting into at least historically women who are more sexually permissive pre the marriage tend to be more likely to be unfaithful during the marriage. So it's, it, and again, this isn't a universal and times are changing now, but this is something that, that has definitely been found to be the case. So now we've talked about a whole bunch of mating preferences. We've talked about the, the different things men look for in women. We've talked about mate guarding. We've talked about all these different things that are men's preferences for, for female partners. Do these actual preferences relate to actual mating behavior? And the answer is they shouldn't. They should not. There should never be perfect correspondence with actual mating for most men, for most men, because first and foremost, there's a limited supply of desirable women, especially that are desirable in all ways. If men will only form long term relationships with women that are perfect, most men are never going to form long term relationships because very few people are perfect or near enough to perfect for it to count. Another important thing is one's own mate value is actually a limiting factor. So let's say a really attractive, really high dominance male is looking for a partner. Well, he's likely to, to be able to be choosy enough to select the ones that are the women that are high mate value, that are very desirable, that check all the boxes. However, someone that, that is not super attractive, someone who's not super dominant, they are never going to get be able to get in a relationship with those women that are higher mate value. So their, their own mate value is a limiting factor. In addition to all of that, parents and kin do often influence one's partners that are chosen, even in society, even in cultures that don't have arranged marriages. So all of these together mean that, that uh, when choosing partners, what is important isn't that a woman meets the perfect mate preferences. What is important is, is that a man, what is likely, what is the most likely thing, what is usually happening is, is the man is seeking for the best possible. Let's look at some conditional mate preferences. Since we've talked about all these preferences that are out there, let's talk about some conditional. How about the effects of men's mate value? I kind of already talked about this, but what about men who are high mate value themselves? Well, like I said on the previous slide, they tend to be more choosy and more discriminating. However, 
They also tend to have more partners, either polygamous, polygamously or through serial monogamy where they've got one partner than another. They also tend to be more likely to be unfaithful because many, many women are seeking them out for short-term mating opportunities. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in the next set of slides when we're talking about short-term mating, what would be the benefits of a high mate value man who ends up with a very attractive partner and she, she just hits all of those check boxes. Why would he ever be unfaithful to her? Well, again, this goes back to evolution and there's a strong evolutionary selection pressure on men engaging in short-term mating, even if they're in a long-term relationship. So one of the issues though, is that this issue of EEA that I've talked about, the era of evolutionary adaptiveness, the environmental mismatch, when these behaviors evolved compared to now, um, many of these evolved preferences served us what, do serve us well today, but some don't. Um, having super strong concerns about attractiveness when living in groups of 40 to 200 was likely adaptive. You, you sought out the, the most attractive you, you could find that was available that would um, become a partner with you. If there's only 40 choices, um, you, you, many of the men are going to be competing for the, the optimal choice. Um, and even in, let's say you're in a group of 200 and let's say a um, hundred of those are, are even a hundred are of age of young reproductive age. Let's, but let's even get down to 50 because that's more likely to be the case. Young reproductive age, single or new in relationships, that type of thing, it's only about 50. That means for a male, there's only gonna be about 25 females, roughly. So that's only 25 that he has to choose from. So seeking out the one that's the most attractive, you, he could be trying for that, find out, no, she's already, she's, she's got suitors that are, are way better than me. Going down the list until the, the right one is chosen. Um, but that, that works out great then. Today though, we, we live in societies where we've got television, we've got advertising, we've got magazines, we've got the internet. We are bombarded with images of women who are highly attractive. And for men now, it's not just a matter of selecting the best one uh, and our standards of attractiveness are raised up beyond what they should be because of that. So when making attractiveness judgments, we may often find ourselves comparing our potential or current mates to unattainable, unrealistic standards. Um, Kenrick actually found that when men are exposed to pictures of highly attractive women, they rate their own partners as less attractive and indicate that they are less committed to them. So this is one of those big environmental mismatches that can actually lead to things like infidelity and, and disillusions of relationships because of these unrealistic standards. Let's go back to these conditionals, looking at those. Do men with resources have greater reproductive success? In traditional hunter-gatherer societies, most data says yes. So a little bit of combination of conditionals and the, the environmental mismatch though, is that in modern societies, the answer isn't always yes. It's actually no, and it's typically due to things like birth control now. Men who are highest mate value, historically, they would have been having lots of children. Today, they're having fewer children due to birth control. What is important here isn't that how many children they're having, because that again is our environmental mismatch when we include birth control, but the question then you should ask is, are men that are higher mate value having more mating opportunities? Are they having more sex? And the answer actually is yes. That in, it's been found in multiple different countries now, um, wealthier men enjoy more sex and um, the relationship here is strongest amongst older men. So older men that, that are wealthy tend to, to have way more sex than older men who are not wealthy.
So let's throw it back to women then. Um, so men have these mate preferences. Men have these mate preferences for, for, for look for certain things in women. So then what are women doing to compete to be chosen by men? I talked about before um, with sexual selection how in most species, men do the competing, women do the choosing. And in humans, that is generally the rule. Men compete to be chosen by women. However, in humans, women also compete to be chosen by men, especially when you're looking at men's mate value as important. Um, especially when you're looking at long-term partners. So if women are, are competing to be chosen against men, what do women do to compete? Well, one of the most important things, the top thing is appearance because appearance is the one of the top things that men are looking for. There's deceptive tactics that occur that women do while competing, especially regarding appearance. So doing things like makeup, surgeries, um, clothing, various different things that increase appearance in an attempt to compete for men. And finally, women do have this tendency to do derogatory statements towards women regarding their appearance, fidelity, and promiscuity. So when women are competing, the, the, one of the, the most common things you'll hear is the word slut. That's, that is an insult designed to indicate that the other person is promiscuous, that the man shouldn't choose her because she is, she is promiscuous. We'll bring these all back, wrap all these up. We talked about some of the things men do. Now we're talking about some of the things women do. Next week, we're talking about short-term mating and short-term mating ties all of this together. So in conclusion, we took the, talked about the benefits of long-term relationships to men. We talked about a bunch of issues relevant to preferences, specifically reproductive value and how beauty, waist to hip ratio. We I, I dropped foot size out, but foot size, Women who have far smaller foot sizes tend to be looked at as attractive. It's why in some cultures they bind feet so that feet are smaller. And this relates to fertility, bilateral symmetry, current ovulatory state. Um, we looked at some issues of paternity. We looked at the, the, these conditional mate preferences and kind of how this all works in modern societies. Thanks. Come on back.